All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, let me start by thanking uh, the various leaders that are um, joining us today. Uh, Public Health Commissioner Dr. Allison Arwitty, um, Business Affairs and Computer Protection Commissioner Rosa Escarano, um, Chairman uh, Gil Viegas, Alderman Mike Rodriguez, uh, and Katya Nunez from Enlace, and one of the members of our Racial Equity Rapid Response Team. Folks, we're here with some very sobering news. For weeks now, we've been sounding the alarm on the record level of daily COVID-19 cases across our city. Now, Dr. Rarity will go into the specific details in a moment, um, but as we're all aware, the rapid rise that we've been experiencing here in Chicago is being felt across our state, across our region, and across the nation. Case in point, one month ago, our daily average uh, of cases had ballooned to 500 cases per day. That was up from early October, late September, where we were in the mid 200s. Based upon our latest data, we're now seeing an average of no less than 1,900 cases every day. Meanwhile, a month ago, our positivity rate was just over 5%. Since then, it's now almost tripled to more than 14%. In some areas of our city, it's actually at 25% or higher. These aren't levels that we've seen since May, and in some instances, they're worse than our peak back in the spring. In response to this clear second surge, we have already undertaken a number of measures, including instituting a curfew for non-essential business operations and continuously encouraging our residents to avoid non-essential gatherings. However, as I said back then, just a few short weeks ago, if we didn't see a dramatic turnaround and soon, we would not hesitate to take further action to keep our residents safe and healthy. And it's that pledge and commitment that brings us here today. Due to the alarming and ongoing surge in COVID-19 cases, the city of Chicago is launching our Protect Chicago strategy. Now this is a multifaceted and comprehensive effort that includes new regulatory actions, neighborhood um, street level activations, and citywide public awareness. But here's the bottom line, and I want people to be very clear about this. If we continue on the path we're on, and you and me and others don't step up and do more, our estimates are that we could see a thousand more Chicagoans die from this virus by the end of the year. And let me say that again, if we do not step up and do the things that we know actually work <clears throat> to protect ourselves, to protect our families, protect people in our network, protect our colleagues, by the end of this year, we will lose at least a thousand more lives in this city. That's just in seven weeks alone. None of us can keep maintaining the status quo in the face of this very stark reality. Everyone, me, you, everyone, must step up and we must do more. Our goal now is the same as it was during the early days of this pandemic, and that is to bend the curve. We are back there. The more we bend the curve, the more we can reopen our businesses and get our lives back to some sense of normalcy. We can limit the spread of this hor horrible virus, mitigate the sickness, and yes, even mitigate the possibility that any more of our neighbors will die. But unfortunately, as I stand here today, we are a long way from where we need to be. Folks, we have to commit recommit to the fundamentals that got us past the first surge. Wearing a mask when you leave your home, socially distancing, washing your hands frequently, keeping yourself out of crowds. But now with Protect Chicago, we will be adding new steps to that list 
so that you will have the tools that you need to protect yourself, your family, and your entire community. These new steps include personal behavioral changes that we all must commit to, as well as regulatory measures that will roll into a new stay-at-home advisory for Chicago that will go into effect at 6 a.m. this coming Monday, November 16th, and will be in effect for 30 days. Now, this is in line with uh, what the governor announced um, yesterday as statewide guidance. And let me take you through some of the particulars of this stay-at-home advisory. It calls upon each of us to do the following, to stay at home unless you must go out for essential reasons like work or school, medical visits, or to get food. No visitor should be in your home unless they're essential workers like home health care or education workers. And no visitors includes family members that do not now today live with you. We're asking you to avoid any non-essential travel. And if you must travel, then you must either quarantine for 14 days or depending upon the state, confirm a negative COVID test before coming back. And while this is tough, and of course this whole year has been tough, we must tell you, you must cancel the normal Thanksgiving plans, particularly if they include guests that do not live in your immediate household. And I want to say these four things again. Stay home unless you have to go out for essential reasons. Do not have guests over. Avoid unnecessary travel and cancel your traditional Thanksgiving plans. Here's why this stay at home advisory is needed now. The increases we're seeing are happening literally across every zip code, every demographic, every age group. However, a major portion of that spread is happening in our homes and private venues with the friends and family who we love and trust. In these spaces, people feel safe. We, you, feel safe. And you let your guard down and you're not as diligent. We have to stop and reverse this trend in order to save lives. Every family needs to come up with their own COVID protection plan and stick to it in the coming weeks and months. And my team is putting together toolkits to help you do just that. I can't emphasize this enough. We have to be serious about this. COVID gets into your homes through someone else who lives there who's been exposed. Making a plan also helps you figure out what to do if you or someone in your household falls ill from the disease. Protecting Chicago means starting with protecting yourself and your family. Now, in addition to everything I just mentioned through the stay-at-home advisory, we're putting in place several new regulatory measures which we intend to vigorously enforce. Ideally, there would be no social events or meetings. But those that still take place now must be limited to no more than 10 individuals. And this applies to both indoor and outdoor settings. And it includes event venues, hotel event spaces, and alternative event venues, such as hotel rooms and rental properties like Airbnbs. Let me just pause on this for a moment. <clears throat> Our hotel industry has been hit particularly hard this year. I understand that. In, in many instances, you're on life support, and we know that to be true as well. And you've done a lot and sacrificed a lot, and you're trying to bring visitors back to your hotels. But that cannot include parties. It simply can't. And I'm gonna urge the hotel industry also to be much more diligent about who's coming in because we've seen an uptick in challenges and problems at downtown hotels and that can't be a thing either. This advisory also goes to houses of worship that must limit the number of guests at special events like weddings and funerals. Again, very challenging but absolutely essential. Let me tell you what this doesn't cover. It doesn't supersede industries um, specifications that have already 
specified capacity guidelines that are in place, such as for fitness clubs, retail stores, movie theaters, and houses of worship for their regular services, not special events. Now, we will be closely working with our faith leaders and community groups to ensure that funeral homes and houses of worship maintain strict compliance with a limit of 10 per space for any special events outside of those regular services. I also want to take a moment to reaffirm our expectation for employers to protect their workers by allowing them to stay home when they are symptomatic and not retaliating against workers who are doing the right thing, who are following the guidance, who are staying at home and are worried that doing so will endanger their employment. Do not take retaliatory actions against workers who are doing the right thing. We can have no tolerance for that in the city of Chicago. Too many of our low wage employees are going in because they're afraid that their jobs won't be protected. I want all of our essential workers to know that you will be supported by your city. And if you feel that your job is being jeopardized, if you feel like um, your employer is not respecting your health decisions, please call us. Just dial 311 and we will jump all over it. And employers, as I said, we will not hesitate to act if we have credible evidence that you're retaliating against your workers simply because they are staying at home because they are sick. And meanwhile, other restrictions remain in place as before. Private residences cannot have more than six people inside who are not household members. I cannot emphasize that enough. Bars and restaurants, unfortunately, will remain closed for indoor dining. And our curfew for non-essential businesses remains in place from 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. And while these restrictions remain the same, we will be ramping up our enforcement. And I want to add this point loud and clear. Please follow the rules. We want you to be able to stay open. But if you do not follow the rules, then we will take swift and immediate action. And retailers, let me remind you, COVID-19 still exists. I spent a lot of time traveling around the city looking from neighborhood to neighborhood. And what I've seen in some retailers is parking lots that are absolutely jammed with cars and yet no lines at the entrance. That tells me something. Something's not right about that. And what I've told my team is that in those circumstances, we are going to be extraordinarily diligent and make sure that everyone is playing by the rules. That's the only fair thing. People are dying. We're seeing a daily uptick in the amount of deaths that we're recording in the city of Chicago. This is literally a matter of life and death. And if we see you violating these rules in any way, we're not going to hesitate to take action, not through warnings, time for that is over. We're going to fine and, if necessary, shut businesses down. This is a time when we all must take this seriously. We all have to step up and do our part. Now, we don't want to have to go down that route, and we shouldn't have to go down that route because we know that people are already suffering. But despite the surge we're currently experiencing, I have been very proud over the course of these last months with your individual and collective efforts on behalf of your city. But we've got to do more. Countless Chicagoans have done an outstanding job in taking personal responsibility and following the public health guidance, and we owe each and every one of you a debt of gratitude and thanks. Thanks for your sacrifices. And I want to also again thank the thousands, maybe tens of thousands, of health care workers, essential workers, first responders, people that are out there collecting the garbage and coming in every single day to help make sure that our city stays on track, that we are able to deliver services. We owe you a debt of gratitude as well, along with the many, many businesses who have been with us every step of the way as partners in staying on top of this incredible crisis that is stretching all of us to the limit. I know that many people are tired 
I'm exhausted. The fatigue is real. I know that some people are also angry and frustrated because all of our lives have been upended by this terrible virus. And even as we put these restrictions in place, um, I know that our success has fundamentally rested on our ability to work together, to find solutions, to educate people into compliance. And that's a key part of our new program of Protect Chicago. It's working neighborhood to neighborhood to develop and execute an on-the-ground strategy. This is a new pillar in our efforts to make sure that we are doing outreach and connecting up with people. Under the leadership of Dr. Arwitty, the Chicago Department of Public Health will be deploying approximately 2,000 city workers, including up to 550 contact tracers and a network of hundreds of community-based organizations to reach out at least to half of the city's households. Contract tracers will support phone banking, door knocking, and peer-to-peer -peer text campaign. 1,100 safe passage workers will be passing out helpful information and materials in high traffic public areas and they will be distributing door hangers translated into multiple languages. And traffic aids from the Office of Emergency Management will also be a part of this effort. <clears throat> we will also be providing community-based organizations with specialized training and support to strengthen their ongoing efforts and to deploy trusted neighbors who will knock on the doors and distribute information. Why is this necessary? Because we know that in some areas of our city, people are particularly scared. They're skeptical of the government and maybe even scared. They're scared and skeptical of the healthcare industry. But what we also know is that we must reach those people in particular because they need our help, they need our support, they are our neighbors, and we cannot leave them in this crucial time. There are some zip codes and census tracts where we're seeing extraordinarily high numbers of infection rates, extraordinarily high numbers of percent positivity, and we've got to do more to reach our neighbors. And I want to credit the number of community-based organizations that have been with us on this journey for quite some time and you'll hear from one in a moment. I also want to thank um, Alderman Rodriguez for coming up with some very specific, tangible things that we can do as a city to reach out to our neighbors to help support and protect them in this incredibly challenging time. This hyper-local focus, grassroots, door-to-door, -door, is in, going to be indispensable as part of our ongoing efforts to protect each other during this difficult time. If we can make breakthroughs in the communities that need us most, that is going to go a long way in helping us overall bend the curve. We have to build trust, and that's why we are leaning into trusted community partners. This is not going to be a top-down effort. This has got to be a grassroots effort fanning out neighbor to neighbor. And I want to thank our partners in advance for the work on this campaign. Partners like Katya Yunkas and everyone in Enlace who have been engaged in this fight for so long. Feedback that we've gotten from a number of other, of other groups like Illinois Unidos and others. We've heard you. We value your feedback. We value your partnership. And we are putting the suggestions that you've given us into action. Finally, all Chicagoans can expect to see this new campaign and messaging across all of our billboards, social media channels, and more to raise awareness across our communities. I want to encourage every Chicagoan to sign up to be part of this campaign, Protect Chicago, um, through online and become part of the online team. Go to chicago.gov forward slash protect. That's chicago.gov forward slash protect if you want to be part of this campaign to protect our neighbors. There are many ways in which you can volunteer, and all of that information is available at chicago.gov forward slash protect. That is how we protect Chicago, and that is how we will save lives. Yours, your family member, your neighbor, 
a life of someone that you love and a life of our city. We've been through a heck of a lot this year and it's not over. These next seven weeks are going to be crucial, crucial in how we start 2021. Are we or will we be in a better place? Can we welcome the new year as something that we look forward to and not dread? The power is in our hands and the answer is to how we step up in these next seven weeks. This is a time that tests all of us. Certainly me as a leader of the city, members of the city council, we've got a lot of things on our plate, a lot of things that we must do to break through. And COVID-19 is at the top of that list. And we have to step up, we have to step up and lead. And we need you, every one of you, to be part of this journey with us. All of our lives are interconnected in ways that we never even realized before this pandemic. And because of that interconnectivity, we all must step up and do our part. Thank you, and I'll welcome Dr. Arwady to the podium. Thank you, Mayor. So I've been up here sharing data for weeks, for months, almost a whole year at this point. And before I get into the data, I want you to hear that I am more worried about COVID right now than I have been at any point since March. In March, I was worried because we didn't have perhaps enough ventilators, because we needed to work very quickly to not meet the fate of what we were seeing in New York City. But in March, I knew that we were taking this seriously as a city. And we were doing that largely out of fear. At this point, we all know somebody who's had COVID. And in fact, in Chicago, given what our numbers look like, a lot of us know someone who's had COVID just in the last few weeks. And it is true, thank goodness, most people who get COVID recover. But when you're talking about the kinds of numbers that we are seeing now and the growth that we are seeing now, those numbers start to impact people who are older, who have underlying conditions. We start seeing and are seeing rises in hospitalizations, ICUs, ventilators, and deaths. We've seen no sign of slowing here and we're in uncharted territory. We are the largest city in the part of the country that is having the most uncontrolled outbreak. Every opportunity that COVID has to spread here is an exponential opportunity. It takes very little time for these numbers to get to a point where we do again start to overwhelm hospitals where we do again start to talk about deaths in ways that I hope to never have to talk about. And yes, a vaccine is coming. The news on that is good. But a vaccine is not the next few months. And the next few months, winter, the flu, and COVID fatigue have the potential to truly create a catastrophe that could be avoided here. So I'll run through the data quickly. As always, chicago.gov slash coronavirus. We are now up to four times as many people being diagnosed every day with COVID-19 in Chicago as one month ago. Our doubling time remains at 12 days. Let me put that in some perspective for you. Right now, we're getting about 2,000 new cases in every day. We're having trouble keeping up. The health department is not designed to do case investigation and contact tracing, to do testing for this volume. But a 12 days doubling time means that by Thanksgiving, we might be seeing 4,000 new cases come in a day. We're not set up for this level of outbreak. And if you look at that curve, there's been no sign yet of it slowing down. 
I sometimes hear people say, sorry, there. I sometimes people hear people still say that this is just because we're testing more. We are testing more. That gray represents our total tests. And every day we are breaking records here in Chicago for the number of tests that are being done. But the concern is that the test positivity rate has approximately tripled over that same month. If this were all related to testing, our test positivity would go down. The fact that it is going up lets us know we're not even keeping up with the testing we need to be doing for this amount of the outbreak. And let me tell you, everybody around the city is doing what they can to build more testing, but we are not set up for a 12-day doubling rate in a city of 2.7 million people to handle COVID. I still hear people say, there's not people getting seriously ill. These are 18 to 29-year-olds. Nobody's really ending up in the hospital. In the last month, three times as many people with COVID-19 in Chicago hospitals as just one month ago. 873 people right now, not in the ICU, but in a Chicago hospital compared to just 291 a month ago. And again, no sign of that slowing down. Three times as many people now in the ICU as one month ago. 247 people today in Chicago hospitals compared to 92 a month ago. No sign of it slowing down. And three times as many people on ventilators in Chicago hospitals as one month ago. And then as you heard the mayor say, three times as many COVID deaths among Chicago residents as we were seeing one month ago. I wasn't able to say that, thank goodness, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Because the way we see COVID work, the surge in cases comes first. Then a few weeks later, the surge in hospitalizations. Then ICU, ventilator, and then death. And so you heard the mayor say that we are projected, if we do not see major improvements here, to have at least 1,000 more COVID deaths in the next 49 days in Chicago residents. And let me tell you, depending on the model that we look at, sometimes it's even higher than that. Some of these models are projecting as much as 1,800 deaths. If we magically stopped our outbreak growth today, we would still have another 400 COVID deaths in Chicago in the next 49 days. It is in our power to save literally 600 lives at minimum between now and the end of the year. And the things that we've put forward today are largely things that are about you making a decision in your life, right? They're about saying, I'm not gonna have people over. I'm not gonna do things that aren't essential. Not forever, but right now, while we're seeing numbers like this. Gathering is the biggest concern because COVID is just looking for an opportunity. And right now, unfortunately, it has so many opportunities all over this city. And with that, I'll bring up Commissioner Rosa Escarino from BACP. Thank you, Dr. Arwady, Mayor. Good afternoon, my name is Rosa Escarino. I'm the Commissioner for the Department of Business Affairs and Consumer Protection. And as the mayor and Dr. Arwardy have said, if we all don't change our behavior and change it right now, hundreds of Chicagoans are going to die by the end of the year. By following the stay-at-home order advisory, you're not only protecting Chicagoans and saving lives by lowering the spread, you are doing your part to help businesses reopen. Our businesses um, and put their workers back to work. You know, in recent weeks, I've been getting a lot of questions about how do we continue to support businesses and ensure that they remain, um, that they basically make it through the COVID. And we must work together, and there are some things that you can certainly do. First and foremost, wear your face mask and practice social distancing. It is the most important thing you can do to help not only our business community, but to help all of our residents. You can uh, order takeout. You can also have food delivered to your home. You can walk down the street to your local uh, commercial corridor and make sure that you are uh, 
safely uh, patronizing those businesses. You can purchase gift cards and you can tip well so that those workers uh, can continue uh, to, um, to, to protect their households as well. But again, the most important thing and the most important message today is that we must all follow the COVID guidelines. When you fail to mask up and when you invite guests into your home, and especially when you attend large gatherings, you are the problem. You are putting everyone at risk, your loved ones, your friends, and you are prolonging the reopening of our marketplace and really hurting uh, individuals that really depend on those jobs. If you are thinking of holding a party or a gathering in your home or in a commercial space, you better think again. And make no mistake, because we are out there and we are enforcing. And we are also closing and issuing large fines and violations. Early in the summer, under the direction of the mayor, we created a task force to crack down on parties because parties actually started back in May. And so we've been at this for a little while now. And again, we are going to continue our efforts on addressing these large gatherings at commercial uh, spaces, but also at residential locations, including hotels and our Airbnbs or house share locations are on our radar. Now is not the time for parties, and there will be consequences for those that do. As the mayor indicated, with the holidays coming up, unfortunately, we must plan differently. To date, this task force has conducted over 300 investigations of large gatherings. We have closed over 50 locations and had uh, nearly 10 locations with multiple days and very high fines and penalties. We are also receiving uh, reports of retailers not following uh, the guidelines and, if anything, uh, ignoring the capacity. And as the mayor said, I've been out there. I'm uh, going into these large retailers, asking to meet with management and asking them to put their protocols in place. And then I follow up with having investigators actually pay visits. Um, and so again, you know, eight months into this pandemic, we know that COVID fatigue is here and it's a real thing, but um, following the guidelines is really what works. For the sake of our residents, for the sake of your family members, and, and truly, which is what I do, is to ensure that we continue to support the, the, the businesses and to ensure that we can make it out of this, um, we must all do our part to ensure um, that we're saving lives. And with that, I'd like to welcome Katia Nukes from El Lance. Thank you, Commissioner Careño. My name again is Katia Nukes. I'm the executive director at Enlace Chicago. Enlace Chicago is a community-based organization serving the needs and interests of the Little Village community members. And our mission is to build the capacity of our stakeholders to confront systemic inequities and barriers to economic and social access. Enlace has been a member of the Racial Equity Rapid Response Committee since March. This is a committee convened by uh, the mayor's office. Uh, when we join, where we join other community leaders, healthcare providers, and city representatives to create strategies and rapidly respond to the emergency. As I said before, we are a community-based organization that focuses in the needs and interests of Little Village community members. Because of the characteristics of the little community and the vulnerabilities that we faced even before COVID hit, our community has been hit extremely hard during the pandemic. The University of Chicago actually published a report that said that two of the factors that make a community more vulnerable for COVID are being undocumented and having a high rate of people that don't have health insurance. And we have both. About 27% of Little Village community members are undocumented and about 44% do not have health insurance compared to 18% across the city of Chicago. So these factors made us extremely vulnerable and we were seeing numbers that are incredibly high back in May. 
from having reports from our healthcare providers who uh, we meet with them once a week and, and Alderman Rodriguez will talk about that a little bit more, but they were reporting at some point rates of 60% positivi positivity, 70% positivity. And from that, you know, we all worked together and through a comprehensive approach, we were down to four or 5%. And now we're again, like the mayor mentioned, 20, 25% and going up. So we're extremely worried because our community, besides the characteristics that I was talking about, poverty, we have a lot of essential workers, a lot of people that work in factories, and as you probably heard, uh, the Illinois Department of Human Services said that factories are one of the places where people get sick the most, and there have been about 50, 52 outbreaks since March in these factories. So we have to tell factory owners that Work for safety is extremely important because people cannot stop going to work. But we can, as the mayor mentioned and Dr. Awadi, there's so many things that we can do to protect ourselves, protegernos, proteger a nuestra familia, proteger a nuestros seres amados. As a community-based organization, we have been working extremely hard to share this message with our community. Our health promoters are talking to people about, you know, that if you are not insured, cost shouldn't be a barrier for you to, you know, go and get care if you need it, for you to go and get a test. So that's a message that our community health promoters safe passages and other teams that are able to talk to people to you know put things in the in in the mailboxes etc are helping us do we have been working in educating the community we have been supporting schools with virtual learning talking to our community members as the mayor mentioned it's so important that community based organizations as staff members that are trusted members of the community are able to take this message to the community about maintaining social distance, wearing our face covering, washing our hands, staying home. I know that's so difficult. I just canceled my Thanksgiving plans. And we were all exhausted and we want to see our loved ones, but we cannot put our, in danger our lives the lives of the loved ones that live with us, like my mother and my two and a half year old. So we need to, we need to make sure that we're protecting ourselves and that we're protecting our loved ones by following the regulations that we are talking about today. And now I want to introduce Alderman Villegas, the city council's for leader, and also um, the Alderman of the 36th Ward. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Gilbert Villegas and I'm the alderman of the 36th Ward, which is located in the city's northwest side and includes the neighborhoods of Belmont Cragen, Dunning, Hermosa, Montclair, and Portage Park. As you may know, our ward has been one of the hardest hit with COVID-19 positivity rates, higher than other communities because our residents make up a larger population of the essential workforce. As we're dealing with Chicago's second surge, Northwest Side continues to be a hot spot. As aldermen, our offices play an important role in ensuring that our residents have multilingual information and resources that they need during the pandemic. That is why since March, our staff has mobilized to make sure our residents are well informed and receive assistance during this time. We have consistently updated our social media platforms with coronavirus testing information. We have hosted mass giveaways, food drives, multiple testing sites, mobile constituent service sites, as well as assisted on many case-by-case -case issues that face our residents. Our staff makes calls to our constituents on a regular basis just to check on them and let them know that they're not alone in this. With the holidays uh, coming up, we can't emphasize enough what you've heard repeatedly today. Watch, watch your distance, wear your mask, and wash your hands. Protect your families, friends, and neighbors. Protect Chicago. 
Thank you. And with that, I'll bring up my colleague from the 22nd Ward, Alderman Mike Rodriguez. Thank you, Gil. Um, Alderman Villegas, uh, Commissioner Arwady, Commissioner Scareño, Mayor, and Katia, thank you so much uh, for um, being here and for your messages. You know, back in March, I started to convene a group of hospitals, clinics, nonprofits, community organizers, and various levels of government agencies to come together weekly in the 22nd Ward, in the Little Village part of the 22nd Ward, uh, to address this issue. We knew that the residents of my ward were at a higher risk of contracting COVID. They weren't going to be able to leverage government assistance programs like unemployment insurance at the state level or stimulus checks at the federal level because of various laws not allowing residents and non-residents alike to be able to leverage those efforts. And we found that by working together, we were able to address this issue. For months, the zip code 60623 had the highest percentage and highest raw numbers of COVID positive cases in the state of Illinois. That is not a distinction that we were proud of, but it's one that we worked diligently on to address. And I have to say that at this point, we're no longer the number one community in those aforementioned statistics. However, over the last four weeks, we've gone from double digits to over 100, over 300, to this past week being over 400 positive cases in the 60623 zip code, according to the Illinois Department of Public Health. It's unacceptable. I'm glad. We're implementing a new campaign called Protect Chicago in our city because not only do we need to protect Chicago, we need to protect our communities, but most importantly, we need to protect our families. There are some very simple things we need to do. We can't congregate. We must wash our hands. We must cancel our Thanksgiving activities. We must. This is very important to keep this pandemic down in our neighborhoods, in our city. Brevemente en español, mi nombre es Michael Rodriguez, soy el concejal del Distrito 22. Les urge hacer varias cosas en nuestras comunidades. Primero, que cancelan las celebraciones tradicionales de Acción de Gracias. Segundo, no debe haber, haber más de 10 personas en una actividad social. Y tercero, que los empleadores deberían permitir que los trabajadores enfermos que se quedan en casa sin problemas por partir por parte de esos empleadores. Um, once again, thank you for having me here. It's a great pleasure to be here with, and, and it's, I've been asked to bring back up our commissioner, uh, Rosa Escareño, uh, la comisionada del nego I will uh, not say that well in Spanish. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> commissioner. Muchas gracias. Uh, I will now introduce uh, a summary of uh, the mayor's message. Hoy la ciudad de Chicago está lanzando una estrategia Protege a Chicago, una campaña para ayudar a reducir la reproducción de los casos de COVID en la ciudad de Chicago. Si los residentes, las empresas y los visitantes de Chicago no realizan cambios para reducir la propagación del COVID, Estamos en camino de mucho peligro y perderemos a cientos de nuestros habitantes antes del fin del año. Un pilar clave de esta estrategia Protege a Chicago será la implementación de varias medidas regulatorias establecidas para combatir el alarmante aumento de casos y hospitalizaciones por COVID. El principal de estos nuevos esfuerzos es un aviso de permanecer en casa. Les pedimos a todos los habitantes de Chicago que sigan medidas para proteger a su comunidad, a su familia, y hay que trabajar juntos para bajar la curva y disminuir estos casos. Además de la advertencia, 
uh, de quedarse en casa, de uh, cancelar todos sus, uh, los planes para el Día de Acción de Gracia y reducir esos números de, de personas que están en sus casas. También la ciudad está imponiendo nuevas restricciones para límites de reuniones en eventos sociales a 10 personas. Comenzando el lunes 16 de noviembre de este año a las 6 uh, de la mañana estará vigente esta nueva regla. Um, estas nuevas uh, regulaciones y el aviso de permanecer en casa se cambiará con una estrategia, perdón, se combinará con una estrategia de, de alcance comunitario. Nuestro objetivo es llegar a todos los habitantes de Chicago con información y recursos, especialmente hacia aquellos que viven y trabajan en, los, en el norte noroeste y en el suroeste de la ciudad, donde hay más casos brotando cada día. La ciudad planea aprovechar aproximadamente 2,000 trabajadores de la ciudad de Chicago, hasta 550 rastreadores de contactos y una red de cientos de organizaciones, así como enlace, uh, para llegar a los habitantes de Chicago, especialmente aquellos que han sido afectados uh, adversa, adversamente por COVID, personas que viven en áreas pobres, personas que no tienen uh, uh, inglés como su primer lenguaje y personas que uh, eh, son trabajadores esenciales y que constantemente están en sus trabajos. Y esta red de, de cientos de organizaciones de organizaciones comunitarias uh, nos ayudarán a llegar a estos residentes, especialmente a aquellos que lo necesitan más. El equipo llevará a cabo una orientación geográfica basada en datos para enfocar nuestros esfuerzos en los códigos postales uh, de vecindarios y áreas con mayor incidencia. Esto ayudará a llevar los recursos, información y apoyo más directo a las personas y familias que, ha, que, que lo necesitan más. Protect, Protect Chicago o Protege a Chicago se ha desarrollado en co coordinación con el Departamento de Salud de Chicago respondiendo a los datos y a los hechos de salud pública y todas las indicaciones que indican que estamos en un brote extraordinario. Chicago, la región y la nación conjuntos han experimentado varias semanas de nuevos casos diariamente y estamos enfrentando un fuerte aumento. Hay que trabajar unidos para proteger a todos los residentes de Chicago y a nuestras familias. Muchas gracias. Y ahora, let me bring back Mayor. Mayor. Let me just say again that if you are interested in being part of the neighborhood activation, uh, please go to shy.gov forward slash protect. That's shy.gov forward slash protect. And with that, I'll take your questions. I think you're up first. Mayor, How are you, sir? Uh, a lot of questions uh, yeah. go around the um, uh, enforcement uh, of your of your advisory, I'll, I'll use Fran Spielman's question because it was the, the first one I got. She says your stay-at-home advisory is just that; it's voluntary. The ten-person limit on gatherings is a mandate. How do you plan to enforce either one in a city when some people refuse to wear a mask? Well, look, this is a progressive step, and I hope we don't have to go any further than this. If the possibility of a thousand more people dying in the city in the next seven weeks doesn't grab you by the throat, as it did me when I started seeing that modeling, um, then there's little that we're going to do to move you. But we will enforce um, the regulatory um, matters that we've identified um, here today and the ones that are already in ex existence. It is, shouldn't be a debate at this point. Wear a face covering. Whenever you go out, whenever you leave your home, take that necessary step. It's not a political, partisan issue. It's a life safety issue. This is absolutely essential for you and for me, but everybody that you come into contact with, you've got to do it. And, and my hope is, and we've got, a, we've got very good compliance, I think, across um, the city, but we have to do more. And we are sounding the alarm that we are at this inflection point where we have to step up even more than what we've already done. 
tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people across the city have done the right thing consistently since the early days of this pandemic. But now more than ever, we need to step up. Heather Sharon uh, wonders uh, if you regret asking Governor Pritzker not to suspend indoor dining and drinking two weeks ago, no. given the gravity of the surge. No, I, I, I do not, because where we're seeing our most significant problem, let me be clear, we're seeing surges uh, in cases really everywhere, but where we're really seeing it is in those private social spaces, homes, weddings, funerals, um, other venues where people think that it's party time. It's not. This is serious life or death. And that's where we need to focus. I said this before. What we're doing here today is we've learned so much since the spring. At that time, we were painting with a very broad brush because we didn't know particularly which interventions were actually going to work. So we followed the CDC guidance and we did blanket coverage on a lot of different things. We now know a lot more. We've got a lot better data. So we can use a surgeon's knife and that's what we're trying to do here today. Claudia Morel asks, uh, why are any non-essential businesses allowed to stay open at all, uh, let mm -hmm. alone until 11 p.m. if uh, we are supposed to be staying at home under the new guidelines? Look, uh, great question. <clears throat> and part of the calculus and balancing that we have to do is not completely and utterly destroy our um, economy, not, not put even more workers out of work and on the unemployment rolls. We want to do what is necessary to have actual impact. As I said, we painted with a very broad brush at the beginning of this pandemic because we didn't know a lot. This was all new to each of us. We now have a sense and we've got a body of data and we know where um, we need to really lean into certain kinds of interventions and that's what we're doing. Uh, <clears throat> Stacy Baca from Channel 7 has a question for Dr. Arwady. Uh, you're advising people to not have gatherings inside their homes, yet the health order requires home gatherings to limit people to six known household members. Can you clarify this message? I can. Let me be very clear on this. The recommendation is to have nobody over in your home. That is the recommendation. That is the safest thing for you, for your family, for Chicago. Where we start talking about the ability to potentially enforce, where we start talking about working with landlords, apartment complexes, etc. Um, there was some desire to put a number there, um, and we recognize that everybody is not, unfortunately, going to follow uh, the guidance. And so it is true that uh, there is an absolute limit in terms of six people. Some of that is about really, again, saying this is not the time for partying, this is not the time for gathering. But the recommendation and my strong ask is that people not have anybody over into their home. Thank you, uh, Becky Bibi uh, says that she got a few tweets and notes from colleagues that they are basically completely booked up. Uh, she's talking about the COVID testing sites, and she's wondering uh, if there are plans to expand testing and what should people do if they can get one? Well, we have um, substantially expanded um, our testing and we're constantly looking uh, for um, other resources so that we can expand it. I think we're now averaging, what is it, about 14,000 tests um, a day. Um, so we, we want to, we talk about this all the time with the state, with our federal partners. We need more testing um, and we're going to look for every opportunity um, to, to do that. Um, and I, well, all I can say is people should be patient. I think what you're seeing in the lines um, and those are particularly in lines of um, City of Chicago testing um, is because um, people recognize this is very serious and important. And I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful that um, people understand that this is not the flu, a cold, something that they can ignore. So we, as I said, we're going to continue to work on building more testing capacity, but it's a good thing that people understand that the resources are there and that they really need to take advantage of them. From Mary Quig, uh, what does the advisory mean for students going to school in person 
And mm -hmm. uh, what has workplace enfor enforcement been like? Has BACP taken any action against businesses for COVID-related retaliation? All right, so there's like three different questions there. Two. Let me two. But, All right, yeah, let yeah. me just let me just say um, we uh, obviously carved out an exception uh, for schools. There's about 40,000 <clears throat> students in the city of Chicago that are going to school um, either every single day um, or in some hybrid um, fashion. Dr. Already has spoken to this extensively. Um, what we've seen in schools across the city is that they have from day one um, implemented a series of protections for, of course, for the students, uh, for the staff, and for the teachers and the building principals. Um, and uh, we think that they, based upon how we're tracking, they are actually doing fairly well under the circumstances. So, um, and then you ask about uh, business enforcement. I'll bring up uh, Commissioner Escarreno to address that issue. So, as you know, uh, we have, uh, under the mayor's leadership, established an anti-retaliation ordinance for which we have already uh, been set up to engage uh, those complaints. We have a handful of complaints that we are working on. Also, as you know, uh, uh, our ordinance also ensures that individuals uh, that work have a paid sick leave. And so we are working with a lot of our partner organizations to, to make sure of that. Was there another question on the enforcement? Um, no, I think she was wondering Anti exactly retaliation. That. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, we, are, we are on it. We're investigating some of the cases that have come through, and we're doing a lot of outreach on that. Have you, have you punished any of these companies? We're working through some of those cases that have come through. Gotcha. All right, some Last questions. Two some questions. Can off I, topic. Can I, yes. Can I also just, yes, um, can I also just add to that? I, I really um, can't emphasize enough that part of um, the street level work that we're going to do also includes um, equipping essential workers to make sure that they know their rights. Um, there's a lot of pressure sometimes that employers place on um, workers to show up, no matter how they're feeling, no matter what the circumstances. We have said from day one, and I'll quote Dr. Ari, even if you're feeling a little sick, stay home. That's essential. We've seen um, an uptick in circumstances where people are sick, they go into work anyway, they test positive. People who have a test pending, they go into work, they test positive. Don't do either of those things. If you are sick, stay home. If you have a test pending, absolutely stay home. And if you're worried that your rights as a worker will not be protected, please do call 311. We have uh, anti-retaliation um, uh, protections for workers. We intend to strictly enforce those, and we will aggressively investigate any case, any complaint that comes in. Obviously, we get information um, on a regular basis about any outbreak that's two or more in a workplace, and CDPH and the team is all over that. But as a worker, if you are sick and you feel like your supervisor is not honoring your rights, please call 311, report it, and we will um, make sure that your rights are enforced. Off Last topic, two yeah. questions. Uh, this morning, Alderman Raymond Lopez uh, tweeted, Lightfoot wants to use the budget management ordinance to remove the carve-outs from the welcoming city ordinance mm -hmm. to protect individuals mm -hmm. with felonies and gang members from ICE. Uh, what world does she think she lives in and all that good stuff? Uh, can you please First, explain what, what, how would it work, and uh, I know there are a lot of people expecting news or, or waiting for news about the carve-outs on the other side of the, of the I, spectrum. Um, I, I won't address the silliness of that tweet. Um, it's offensive, frankly, uh, to people in the city um, who are fearful every day of ICE coming and knocking on their door to children that um, leave their homes during the day and are fearful that they're going to come home to an empty house, um, a husband, a wife. Um, so if you don't have empathy for the people that are experiencing that kind of fear on a daily basis, there's nothing that I can say or do um, that's going to change your cold, hard heart. Love. But I, what I will say is this. Um, I made a commitment a year ago that we would eliminate the carve-outs in a welcoming city ordinance that many people believed made it easier for immigration officials to take undue action against residents of our city. I am honoring that commitment, and I ask for uh, aldermen to support that. If you don't support it, you don't think that um, our immigrant and refugee community deserves protection, you'll be on record as, as casting your vote against that. 
but I think many people understand that this is really essential to the essence of who we are as a city. We are a welcoming city, and proudly so. Last question. Last one. Uh, following this week's fire and the history of concerns over General Iron, uh, will the city halt the permitting process? And do you feel its uh, move to a southeast side is still appropriate? Look, th that business on the southeast side has been there for 20 years. I absolutely understand um, people's concerns, but what that sale involves is not General Iron moving to the southeast side. It's an asset sale, meaning they're going to buy the equipment of that company and continue their operations that have been there and I think relatively um, problem free for 20 plus years. I know that this raises a lot of emotions. We've made a commitment that just as we did with General Iron, we are strictly enforcing um, the various regulatory and environmental standards and we will continue to do so. Um, if there's a problem, we will hold them accountable. Thank you, Mariana. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you.